Thanks for the introduction, Jan, and thanks to the Levy Institute and the Ford Foundation and Mines for uh, bringing me down to Rio to uh, share some of my work with, uh, with all of you folks. Um, this session is on global capital flows and economic development. I'm sharing the panel with two distinguished Brazilians, so I'm going to leave the Brazil to the Brazilians and try to put some of this uh, in some global context. I'm calling my talk uh, Regulating Capital Flows Is the Quote Unquote System Working? Uh, there's an odd narrative going on in the United States now that the system worked um, because the Fed gave swap lines to uh, to developing countries and we had such a great stimulus package that uh, that things are moving on. I, I beg to differ, especially when you talk about uh, capital flows. Uh, some of what I'll talk about comes out of um, a project that I'm working on that's also sponsored by the Ford Foundation. Jose Antonio Ocampo and I are co-chairs of something called the Party Task Force for Regulating Capital Flows for Long Run Development. We had a report in 2012 that looked at the rationale for regulating capital flows and country experiences. And then we came out with one this year in 2013 um, that looks at the extent to which regulating capital flows is compatible with WTO and, uh, and uh, bilateral investment treaty rules. The answer to that one isn't, is, isn't very good. So what are my four points in case uh, your nice lunch puts you to sleep or I put you to sleep? Uh, one, I'm, first I'm going to talk about capital flows in the crisis and despite the fact that capital flows played such a core role in the crisis in the United States and in the European crisis that uh, cap the global financial cycle, and uh, we'll make an argument that there's now a global financial cycle, uh, is even more accentuated now than it ever was. What is somewhat interesting is that this time was somewhat different with the respect to emerging market and developing countries because over 40 or so emerging market and developing countries, in addition to intervening in foreign exchange markets, also put in place regulations on the flow of capital. And this time was also different in that the West didn't really clamp down on countries like they did, at least relative to the 1990s. Uh, however, that, uh, that system where the North can do whatever it wants and as long as the South puts in t tiny little taxes that uh, aren't going to aren't gonna really shake things up that much, uh, that system is uh, far from adequate. And finally, I'll uh, give some ideas about how uh, a better managed system of global capital flows would work that would include both the North incorporating the externalities of their monetary policy and the South putting in place speed bumps on their end. So first, let's talk about capital flows in the crisis. Uh, this is a picture of net capital inflows to emerging markets and developing countries from 1995 uh, through, the, through, uh, through the first quarter of 2011. Um, we used to shock people with the graphs like this because we thought that these were such high peaks and troughs in the 1990s. Now they almost don't fit on the kinds of graphs that we have when we add the, the current crisis. The level of capital inflows, the size and the scale of the sudden stop, and then the repeated surge in capital inflows into emerging markets and developing countries uh, has been quite, quite turbulent both before and after the crisis. And that's, that's no news to anybody living here uh, in Brazil. What is starting to come out in some of the most rigorous empirical work is that the core push factor for this is the Federal Reserve of the United States. The expansion of the U.S. balance sheet, both on the short term and in the long term, has created abnormally low interest rates, which I'm in favor of to a certain extent from, as a U.S. citizen trying to improve employment. But unfortunately, we haven't coupled those policies to uh, an agenda of making it work for productive development in the United States, given the fact that we had a liquidity trap for a long period of time. No investor wanted to invest in a factory or a restaurant in the United States. Instead, they, uh, uh, they went abroad. This is a table from uh, some new research by a woman named Helene Ray in a very interesting article that she presented at the Jackson Hole Central Bank Summit in, t in August of 2013, um, which to people who follow Minsky and so forth, you might see this as uh, Columbus discovers America, right? The people have been thinking about this stuff for 20,000 20, years, but uh, it's very significant that the world of central banks is now starting to uh, understand what a lot of us have been talking about for a long time. So what does this graph show? She, this this uh, green line here is the VIX, 
Index, which is our indicator of volatility in the market. And through rigorous econometric analysis, she's shown that the risk, that the VIX is strongly correlated with and negatively correlated with uh, expansion of leverage, expansion of credit, and expansion of equity abroad outside of the United States. So when there's less volatility, when there's less volatility and the VIX is low, then there's a massive outpouring of leverage, credit, and equity. Interestingly, not FDI. FDI is not too correlated with the VIX. And then in a separate, separate analysis, she says, well, what is the biggest driver of the VIX? And the federal funds rate is the biggest driver of the VIX. So many finance ministers, including the finance minister of Brazil, uh, over the past two years have been very, very concerned about US monetary policy. And that is somewhat proven by these, these kinds of analyses, that when the federal funds rate is low, the VIX goes down, and for four or five quarters after that, there's massive expansion of leverage, equity, and, um, uh, and, and, and just general debt. Well, <clears throat> when that goes out into the, into the world economy, it finds its home uh, through, or at least uh, in this last set of bubbles, it's found its home through the foreign exchange derivatives market. And it's found the, its home where the interest rate differentials between the U.S. and other countries is the highest. So this is just uh, Brazil, Chile, South Africa, and South Korea, four countries that, uh, that are, were large destinations for the massive surge in capital inflows from 2008 till, uh, through about 2011. You can see in the Brazilian case that the interest rate differential was somewhere about 10 percentage points uh, and also high. In, uh, in the other three countries. Uh, this this uh, foreign exchange instrument that folks use here is called the carry trade. Um, and what happens is a investor will borrow in what's called the source country with the United States where, where the rate is so low and then invest in the target country. And the interest rate differential is what's referred to as the carry. That gets accentuated by if you have a lot of leverage and you go short on the dollar and log on the Brazilian real at the same time. If you're doing this with, uh, with hundreds of million dollars, you can actually influence the movements and make, uh, make a lot of money on, on both ends. Um, and it's been shown that the carry trade and the low interest rate has been the two key push factors of capital inflows to emerging market and developing countries in, in the wake of the crisis. And that it's, it's caused what, uh, what some new economists are referring to as the financial amplification effect. When you get a surge of capital inflows, you get an appreciation of the exchange rate, you expand domestic credit uh, through the global financial cycle, um, and that increases aggregate demand. But when there's a sudden stop, like there was a short one after the European crisis in 2010, um, and the beginnings of one when the Fed started to talk about tapering in May, you get a unwinding of all of that position. You get a decline in prices, a reduction in the, in the exchange rates, you get massive ba balance sheets effects, and you get, sl you get slow growth. What's interesting is that the neoclassical economists now have sort of discovered this, and now there's a major debate on what is the optimal tax to correct for this market imperfection, um, which has led to somewhat of a, a, a re-justification for regulating capital flows. Well, this cycle has happened since 2008, 2009. This shows net capital flows, non-foreign direct investment capital flows to emerging markets. That's the blue bars since, uh, since the crisis. And the red is the appreciation in the real exchange rate across emerging market and developing countries. What's the real, not rather than the real. That's right, I have to remember where I am. It is the real effective exchange rate for an index of emerging market countries. This is the IIF data. Um, what's interesting is that this time was somewhat different. Um, in the 1990s um, and in the run up to the crisis up through 2007, when emerging market and developing countries uh, managed exchange rates and managed this financial amplification effect, they are more apt to uh, intervene in currency markets. But in the wake of the crisis, over 40 countries actually put in some sort of a regulation on the inflow of capital. Um, uh, many of the countries use what I would call first and second generation regulations. First generation regulations are quantitative restrictions on the inflow of capital, like in Indonesia had a uh, withholding tax on, uh, a withholding limit on the amount that could, that could come in. 
Other countries use what I'd call second generation regulations, which are more market based instruments that tax the inflow of capital. Brazil had one of those uh, in 2009. But what's interesting and, and, and what's indigenous to emerging market and developing countries is that Brazil, Peru, and South Korea, uh, independent of each other to, for, from, from what I can tell, uh, created a, a, what I'd call a third generation of capital account regulations. And these are direct regulations on the foreign exchange derivatives market because that was such a core channel uh, for the transmission of the monetary policy into their countries. And so Brazil had the non-interest reserve requirement on bank short dollar positions. Maybe my other two panelists are going to talk about that. Peru and South Korea had very, very similar regulations in the foreign exchange derivatives market. Um, Brazil and South Korea, I should say, were the most active. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Eileen Grable, says that markets are so responsive to these things that countries have to constantly fine tune the regulations. So if you look at the econometric evidence of, of Indonesia's one time only half percent withholding tax on inflows, it didn't really have much of an effect. But most of the econometric analysis shows that the Brazilian and the South Korean cases had some of an, some of effect because the authorities were constantly fine tuning the regulations. There's a new study by the Emerging Markets Division at the Fed, at the, in the United States Fed, which shows that those countries that used uh, capital account regulations in the wake of the crisis uh, had less ex exchange rate appreciation relative to those that didn't. Um, and there's a new, brand new paper released this week by uh, my colleague Jose Antonio Campo and Bilga Erten which shows that those countries that put in place these kinds of regulations in the wake of the crisis grew faster than those that didn't. So if that's what happened, if we have this system where the United States and the, uh, and the core monetary uh, centers of the world put in place their own monetary policies, but they don't really care about the global impacts of them, but they're at least this time not going to go and clamp down on the developing world, uh, when it tries to manage those, is that a working system? Barry Eichengreen had an article in the Financial Times that said, hey, we sort of have what we wanted at, at Bretton Woods. We're sort of coordinating at both ends, right? Before, it used to be uh, what the US is famous for saying, it's our dollar and your problem. Now it's our dollar, and I would amend it to say, we used to say, it's our dollar and your problem, and we're going to really police what you do to deal with that problem. Uh, through the IMF and through other mechanisms. Um, this time it was a little less. There was, it's our dollar, it's your problem, but we're so distracted by other things, you can do whatever you do, you know, just deal with it. Um, I, I don't see that as the system working, but how do we, how do we want to think about that? Uh, Charles Kindleberger, in his book, The World in Depression, uh, has a list of five public goods that he thought a hegemon, or other people say that international institutions, should provide the world to prevent and mitigate financial crises. Uh, maintaining open markets in a recession, providing counter-cyclical lending, policing a relatively stable exchange rate system, ensuring macroeconomic coordination, and acting as a lender of last resort. Uh, we, it, I would say it's, these are all debatable about the extent to which they uh, happened during the crisis. I think the WTO, which we were mentioning before, get, should get a little bit more credit for maintaining uh, open markets during a recession. The U.S. had a big Buy America component to its fiscal stimulus package, and countries like Brazil and South Korea waived regulations at the WTO to make sure that that was channeled, uh, channeled in a different way, and obviously the Fed did provide these credit lines. But three of these key public goods there has not been enough coordination on um, and therefore we are the system has not worked in either preventing the crisis that we had and uh, mitigating the one that we're in uh, in Bretton Woods um, interestingly we set up it's sort of a, it's it's amazing for an American who just left a country where you know we're begging each other to expand the debt ceiling to be able to get through yet another quarter um, and that you know, the, the, the world leaders went up to New Hampshire and in, in, in almost about two weeks they created, they created a whole set of institutions to try to deal uh, with these five, five issues. They created the trade regime to deal with the open markets. They created the IMF for the uh, exchange rates and for, and for the lender of last resort to a certain extent and the World Bank for countercyclical lending and they launched the sort of G7 or G2, whatever it was at the time, kind of process. It's hard to believe that that kind of global governance could uh, could happen now, and Paulo Batista, Paulo Noguer Batista, indicated uh, how how tricky that is and how polarized that's becoming. 
enshrined in the Articles of Agreement of the, of the IMF is, in Article 6, is the policy space to regulate capital flows. Um, and there's lots of books and articles written about uh, Harry Dexter White and, and John Maynard Keynes and how they disagreed on so many different things, but oddly this is one of the few things that they did agree on. Not only did they agree that countries should be regulating capital flows, they, in their initial drafts they said that they should be coordinated at both ends. That the, and so in today's context that the emerging markets should be coordinating with the monetary authorities of the, of the center to make sure that there is a balance of capital flows because if not, um, it will distort the trading system and, and run, down, run down the world economy. This remains in place. In the late 1990s, there was a big move by the industrialized countries to basically totally rewrite this and make capital account liberalization a goal just like the current account. But luckily, emerging markets, developing countries, and some progressive Congress people in the United States stopped that in the 1990s. Um, however, there's, this issue became, uh, became a big issue again in two, 2010 to 2012 where uh, the IMF decided to let's, let's rethink some of these issues after the crisis. And they've gotten a lot of play for saying, hey, the IMF endorses capital controls now. Isn't that great? They now see that this is a problem. Um, five minutes remain? OK. Um, I've got about five to go. Um, and when, what they're referring to uh, is something called the, the new IMF institutional view on managing, managing capital flows. And what the IMF really has agreed to is regulating capital inflows as a last resort after a whole bunch of other things like increasing capital requirements, reducing public debt, intervening in the, in the foreign exchange market, and so forth, um, then they may sanction whether or not a country should be able to use uh, uh, capital controls or capital account regulations. Uh, they still see capital account liberalization as a, as a long-run goal for every country. But to their credit, interestingly, they do say that developed countries should be more, um, more conscious of what the spillover effects might be. And they zero in on the fact that many developed countries, especially the United States, um, writes into our trade treaties that you are not allowed to manage your capital account with, uh, with, with regulations. And the IMF, to their credit, they, they zero in on that. Um, well, one of the coordinating bodies, like uh, Paulo Nogueira said, is that we've moved from a G7 to a G20 system. And that has some benefits, but uh, lots of benefits in sort of conversation and engagement, but so far no significant benefits in terms of actual change in policy. One thing we can see is that the conversation has totally changed. I have a 2013 G7 communique here where the G7 says, hey, we're going to expand our balance sheets and we can do whatever we want. Um, but when they meet with the, uh, when they meet with the, at the G20, um, friends like Paulo Nogera and others make sure that there's language in there that says, hey, wait a minute, you have to be, uh, you have to be conscious of the negative spillovers. So that's a real counter counterfactual. When you get people like Paulo in the room, you get language like this. When you just get the world's industrialized central bankers, you, get, uh, you, you don't get any attuned to it. Um, however, there's been little coordination on the actual macro policy, so they're saying things in communiques which are a little bit more what we'd like to see, but obviously this correlation between the federal funds and the VIX uh, has only accentuated, and, uh, and so there hasn't been much co coordination on the ma macro policy. One interesting thing that uh, you can also have a counterfactual with is something called the G20 coherent conclusions on the management of capital flows, also something that Brazil played a, played a huge role on. Now remember, as Paulo said earlier, that the IMF, the voting structure, is stacked where emerging market and developing countries, even with these brick-like coalitions, don't have all the voting power. So in that framework, when the IMF started to do a rethink on capital account regulations, um, may, uh, Jose Antonio Campo and I said, well, there was sort of a half step forward. Now they're not going to call capital account regulations uh, regulations of mass destruction, but they're going to make sure you try everything in the kitchen sink before you go for it. Um, that's in a international environment where the North has the most of the voting power. When you have something like the G20, where there's more like 
more like equal say in the conversation, the G20 put out a, um, a communique or a, or a thing called a coherent con conclusions where they said, no, capital regulations can go alongside all of these other measures and they, can, and, and, uh, and they don't have to go through another sequence. Uh, of course, this is non-binding, but it shows that the conversation is at least changing. And this, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was an initiative of the emerging markets that the um, that the North, uh, Northern Central Bankers and the heads of the states uh, um, signed. Interestingly, then this was just, this was then used in the IMF uh, by emerging market and developing countries to punch, again, uh, punch above their weight, right? To say, hey, how come you signed this stuff at the G20 and now you don't want us to talk about this uh, here in the IMF because you have, you have more voting. I see that as a positive sign. I'll end on this one. One of the one of the most glaring things, and I, I'm not sure that many folks in the, who follow emerging markets have have noticed this, is that there's been very little coordination on on uh, on reform, on financial regulatory reform. So we all committed that we were all going to go regulate our derivatives markets, and that we were going to do it in a co coordinated fashion. And so from a capital flows perspective, you would want to see r leverage ratios, margin requirements, position limits on, in the foreign exchange derivatives market, right? That would be a core thing that, say, Brazil has the regulations like it had, South Korea has the regulations like it had. Well, if in the Dodd-Frank bill there was the same kind of regulation, that would be an implicit coordination on both ends. Well. On, the, on uh, the Friday night of a holiday in 2012, Secretary Geithner exempted foreign exchange swaps and forwards from the entire bill. That's not very known. That's not, that didn't get a lot of press because it was during a holiday and all the guys at Bloomberg were home with their, uh, home with their families. Um, and so in so doing, his recommendation or his, his, uh, his excuse for that was, well, the foreign exchange derivatives market was not at the core of the North Atlantic crisis. And that's true. The derivatives that were at the core of it were these housing-backed securities. But this, is, this shows how much of a, a sort of a failure the global coordination is because the United States is basically putting together its financial regulatory reform without thinking about the global spillover effects. And I'm not sure that the Brazils and the Indias and the Russias caught this, and uh, we, we need to push back on this a little bit. Unfortunately, most of the rules are already set. Um, but just by putting leverage ratios, margin requirements, and all the other things that are in Dodd-Frank, as weak as it is, um, would have pr provided some buffer on the U.S. side. Another key thing that needs more attention that a lot of us are trying to focus on now, it's not a big problem for Brazil, but it's a big problem for the Argentinas of the world, which is the uh, trade treaties, especially bilateral investment treaties. Uh, trade treaties and bilateral investment treaties, especially those from the United States, require that all transfers of investment flow freely between the partners, freely without delay, without an exception even for balance of payments crisis. Um, in the WTO, there's an exception for a balance of payments crisis, but there isn't a, there's a debate about the extent to which there's an exception for more prudential kinds of regulations. In the United States, the U.S. government makes sure that there's no, uh, there's no dispute that absolutely, uh, as minted in the, in, the, in the legislation and in the treaties, that countries can't put in place these regulations. And moreover, if you put in the regulation, you're subject to what's called an investor state dispute. So J.P. Morgan can directly file a claim against the government of Brazil rather than, say, at the WTO, where the United States government would have to go to Geneva and take the Brazilian government to, to dispute. Brazil is great on this. Brazil uh, and, and uh, uh, um, Luis Fernando has written a paper about this. Brazil and its GATS schedule at the, at the uh, WTO made sure that there was space to be able to do this, and Brazil has a policy not to sign bilateral investment treaties, um, and therefore they have the policy space to do what they were doing. Unfortunately, the Perus of the world, the South Koreas of the world, and countries like Mexico, if they ever wanted to uh, change the way they do things, um, they would not have the policy space to do that. So final, uh, final slide. What would, a, what would a more coordinated approach be in a system that, uh, that might come closer to working? Uh, things for emerging market and developing countries, industrialized nations, and international institutions. Emerging market and developing countries uh, probably need stronger and more institutionalized capital flow management uh, strategies. And I would suggest that they get cloaked in a macro prudential framework 
with all due respect to Brazil, when Brazil was announcing these regulations to the world, they very verbally and very vocally said that they were reactions against a tsunami that was coming from the, uh, the U.S. monetary policy and that the, this was their, you know, offensive defense of that, which is completely true. But by communicating that way to the markets, it, uh, it created some turbulence and some scariness. And when capital started to retreat from Brazil um, and they've been trying to encourage more of it to come, some investors have said, well, how am I, how am I going to know whether or not you're really going to honor this commitment? Are you going to put some capital control in place? Whereas Peru and South Korea have the same kinds of regulations that Brazil had. But when the Bloomberg reporter said, oh my gosh, these are capital controls, what are you doing? They said, no, 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 these aren't capital controls. These are prudential regulations to regulate the foreign exchange derivatives market here in my country to create, uh, you know, to, to make sure we have macro prudential situations here. And then they all went away. All right? and, and so the, uh, this third generation of, uh, of, of regulations, which is indigenous, you know, it, I, to, as far as I know, I mean, uh, um, Professor Barbosa is here, your team, uh, I don't know if you copied them from South Korea or you folks came up with them yourself or where these things came from, but they certainly didn't come from my country. And, um, and so calling them something new, because they indeed are something new, is, uh, is a way to communicate it to markets. And if you also had a permanent piece of legislation, like Brazil does with its IOF, that uh, was calibrated to say the debt to GDP ratio and that it automatically goes in, that also won't scare markets so much. Um, and for countries unlike Brazil and Peru and South Korea, more of a focus on the foreign exchange derivatives market than, uh, than, than the more traditional areas of capital inflows. Well, uh, emerging market and developing countries should not be carrying the entire burden, as we showed that the big push factor is from U.S. Mon monetary policy. And there has to be a move by the industrialized nations to internalize the negative spillovers abroad. It's actually in our inter interest, right? Ben Bernanke did not push interest rates low to try to create bubbles in Brazil, India, and Indonesia. It was supposed to be for factories and restaurants in the United States, but we're in a liquidity trap. And so banks were holding money and not lending it to those folks and seeing all these opportunities with the uh, interest rate differentials. Of course, it was going here. So we need to channel our monetary policy towards domestic productive investment, and therefore the spillovers would be through imports to from emerging market and developing countries in the real sector which would expand jobs in your countries and so forth. Um, also, we should signal clearly beforehand, right, this tapering discussion in May took the world by took the world by storm, and then when we decided not to do it last week, that took the world by storm too. This is a clear, uh, cl clear thing that, uh, that, that needs to be done. And given the fact that there's an increasing consensus that capital flows need to be managed, the United States should do a better job of vocally supporting, right? They made a big step by not clamping down Right, uh, Larry Summers and Rubin and Geithner in the 1990s were just all over Malaysia in the press. And this time, it, uh, it, when Geithner came to Brazil, he was sort of light about it, and they actually praised it to a certain extent in South Korea. Um, I think that, uh, uh, that if, if the center country is saying that this is more legitimate, um, it obviously will send the signal to markets because the, the biggest concern is how the markets are going to react. Are they going to overreact to this kind of issue? International institutions should coordinate more on equal ground um, to take off, and I didn't put this after Paulo's talk, I had this here before, but if you, if you look at those two communiques, it shows the more equal footing the emerging markets have, the better the conversation is. And so we need to accelerate IMF quota reform and the alternative institutions, the G20, the BRICS Reserve Bank. And what's interesting, to, since, uh, since you were being so modest, what's interesting is that these alternatives also help you within the, the unjust bodies like we have. By the fact that there is this brick reserve pool, it allows you to punch above your weight uh, in, the, uh, in the IMF to a certain extent because, uh, because it, it threatens the system. Um, there should be more IMF surveillance on the industrialized countries, right? So when the U.S. is lowering the federal funds rate, they should be doing studies and communicating to the world that this is going to have a, a negative impact. And since their new institutional view says that capital account regulations in some instances are warranted, when a country does it, Christina Lagarde should be having a press conference in support of that. So India, a couple weeks ago, uh, put in place 
uh, outflows regulations because they had a 20 percent devaluation since May. If you look at even the narrow institutional view of the IMF, it would sanction what India did. IMF was silent on it. If the IMF is out there sanctuary, sanctuaring things, or at least if they're asked about it, maybe they don't go out of their way, but if they're asked about it, they should, uh, uh, they should, they should endorse these things um, because they unfortunately uh, serve as the people who do the homework for the investors who do no homework. Um, finally, I also think that uh, there should be more, more support for the enforcement and capabilities of these things. Even the Brazils and the, and the South Koreas that have really sophisticated finance ministries and central banks and can come up with these innovative instruments, uh, when you do the analysis, they had, you know, they had a, a small but significant impact. And if we really want to create the policy space for independent monetary policies and for channeling finance into productive development, these are going to have to be much stronger and countries need to be able to build the capacity to do so. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to, uh, well, first of all, I, I'm not really uh, concentrate on the crisis uh, itself. I would like to extend a little the, the horizon here for this discussion. Uh, the crisis made some of our problems sharper, but most of them were actually already here for almost 20 years, particularly after the stabilization plan uh, that was very successful to fight inflation in 1994. But it did create a, a situation a, uh, where balance of payments problems and exchange rate problems and uh, uh, were very frequent and uh, created a very volatile structure uh, where problems that we had during the crisis, and we are actually you are having right now, I was checking the exchange rate uh, today during lunchtime, and uh, volatility is now a part of our everyday life. Uh, but those problems, as uh, I want to, to stress here, uh, they actually are here since the mid-90s. And uh, it has been very difficult, actually, both for more conservative governments, like uh, the one that was in the, in the 90s, or center-left uh, parties uh, of uh, Lula and Dilma and so on. Uh, nobody uh, uh, so far has found a more effective way out. Uh, so I will, I will cover uh, I, I, what I want to, to stress here are five uh, lessons, I think, are, are some uh, features of our experience that uh, were, uh, are certainly of our own interest. Uh, especially in the side of, of the practicalities that we were told this morning. I'm, I'm, I'm concerned of, of uh, how these things have worked here. Uh, but I think it is, uh, uh, this may be useful for, uh, uh, to analyze the experience of, uh, of other countries. Uh, well, for those of you who are not entirely familiar uh, with our history uh, with capital controls, uh, very quickly, Brazil had a very extensive uh, set of capital controls until the early 80s, until the crisis, the debt crisis of the first half uh, of the 80s. Uh, those controls were created on the basis of a legal conception of uh, how the country should relate to foreign capital. Uh, and the idea, uh, the main principle was that there is a right to exit only for capital that uh, came first. So the Brazilian citizens do not have a legal right to send uh, money abroad. This is not recognized, but the principle was that uh, whoever brings capital has the right to take it back uh, under, of course, legal restrictions and so on. This principle has informed practically all regulation and all legislation that was written in Brazil. We have one central uh, legal document, that, uh, which is Law 4131, that has been reviewed many times, but the principles are still there, actually. Legally, they were never abandoned, uh, which are based on this statement that I just uh, reproduced, that there is a right to exit only 
for the values that actually came into the country. That, uh, this is very important because of the discussion uh, that sometimes in these debates, not only, uh, I'm not referring to this debate, but uh, debates about uh, this, uh, the question of capital controls, sometimes focus too much on foreign capital. I, I usually prefer the expression international uh, capital movements because it's not only the problem of non-residents. In a sense, we have a, sometimes when we had a balance of payments crisis in uh, the more recent ones at least, like 1998, this was created by residents actually Capital flight is a problem when residents actually uh, take their money away. Uh, usually for, uh, our experience has been that foreign investors or non-residents, they follow the movement. So when they see that, uh, it, it is more or less uh, obvious why, because usually foreign investors are protected by contracts or by laws or by whatever uh, the context is. Uh, usually capital flight is initiated by residents that feel that they could be somehow limited in this uh, freedom. So we had this, uh, uh, for many f decades, we had a very extensive system of capital controls, both uh, to inflows and, uh, and to outflows. This, was, this began to be dismantled in the second half of the 1980s. Uh, under the programs, the adjustment programs that were sponsored by the IMF uh, after the, inter the Latin American debt crisis. Uh, this pr uh, proceeded actually through the 90s and the 2000s, and it was uh, very ecumenic in its uh, political nature. It was done by governments, uh, it was pushed by governments like Cardozo, but it was also pushed uh, under Lula's government. This was uh, there was this kind of uh, tacit agreement that liberalization uh, was a kind of, uh, of uh, universal or consensual uh, tactic. So uh, uh, at this point, the law is still the same, the principle is still there. Uh, many changes actually that have been made in terms of uh, capital account liberalization were done circumventing the law, actually were done by decision of the central bank which does not have the authority to do this. So this is a kind of, this is done through uh, backdoor uh, mechanisms that you issue instructions for banks uh, of how w uh, should they register those operations and then you just reduce the number of requirements that the transactors have to fill uh, to the point in which nowadays uh, it's practically non-existent. So the experience that we have, uh, that we have had since the mid-90s, uh, after uh, inflation was finally put un under control, I think I would, uh, I would like to suggest that there are at least five lessons that are very important to analyze uh, this experience and eventually to derive some lessons. I, uh, what should I do to move? Okay, the five lessons, uh, and as I just said, have to do mostly with the practicality of uh, controls. I think the theoretical discussion is about capital controls is more or less exhausted. All the arguments are clearly known and uh, whatever could be accepted as persuasive either is or isn't it, but there is not much new in theoretical terms that can be uh, said, or at least it seems to me. Uh, but I think there are five, uh, these five aspects of our experience that help us to uh, perhaps to get the discussion a little deeper. First of all, and it will be clear uh, in a moment why I, I included this, is to be clear that not all problems uh, generated by the balance of payments uh, are caused by the capital account. Uh, I have a particular concern that will be uh, shown in, the, in some of the other items is uh, when people demand too much from capital controls. Usually the success standard that is applied to this is like the only security 
a strategy that is good is the one that eliminates homicide, for instance. And uh, so if somebody is killed somewhere, so was, I told you so, that uh, this would not work and so on. So it's very important to, to have in mind that uh, not all of our problems with balance of payments and its uh, domestic implications are generated by the capital account. No, uh, we do have some difficulties with the current account, uh, as we are going to mention in a minute. The second one is, uh, is a theoretical point that used to be raised a lot and uh, f for some years has been forgotten, uh, which is the idea that floating exchange rates should, make, uh, uh, should eliminate the need for capital controls because the idea is that the, 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 the change in prices of foreign currency would create incentives either to stop capital flight or to stop capital inflows. So uh, when, uh, 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 in 1999, when Brazil changed its exchange rate regime to a floating regime that we have uh, uh, to this day, uh, but this is an old point, uh, uh, government economists used to uh, insist on this, that the, the need for capital controls was something old fashioned because you had a market mechanism that should be much more effective. This, uh, uh, but uh, uh, they are not really uh, substitutes, uh, as we are going to explore uh, in a minute. Uh, second, uh, the third lesson, I think, is, is something that was very strong, uh, uh, particularly in the IMF uh, rhetoric of the 1990s and beginning of the 2000s, the, the terrible times of Michel Candesus which was the low point of the IMF, you know, at, uh, like the old Larry Summers, Geithner, and uh, uh, in the U.S., uh, you had Michel Candesius in the IMF, and this was by far the period in which the fund made the strongest pressures for liberalization and had the more deleterious effects on, on, on emerging economies. And uh, when the discussion, uh, when the, the, the issue of uh, uh, excess capital inflows and eventually overappreciation of the domestic currency came up. The uh, recommendation that, uh, of the IMF was to liberalize capital outflows. So the idea was that okay, if, if, if they are coming uh, in, 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 in too much, in too big values, just open the door so they can uh, live freely. And this was very important uh, in our own experience. Many measures taken by successive uh, federal administrations were oriented by this, uh, measure after measure that made it easier uh, for residents in particular to take their money out or for exporters, for instance, not to bring their money into the country, not to internalize and so on. The fourth lesson I think is something very important uh, uh, is a similar criticism that I have uh, uh, against the Basel uh, strategy, at least until Basel II, is, uh, uh, is the idea that you have to think of sophisticated mechanisms that are able to discriminate between the good inflows and the bad inflows. And uh, the point I want to suggest is that this, uh, as was the case with Basel II, this is probably a waste of time and, uh, and doesn't work. And finally, one lesson that I think particularly uh, I remember talking about this with Nelson a few times is a political thing, uh, is a political problem that after you have a, a period of liberalization, it becomes very, very difficult to go back to recreate problems. It's not, uh, uh, it's completely asymmetrical. You can dismantle these controls very quickly, but after, uh, afterwards, if you want to, to put them back, it is very difficult. Uh, well, the first point, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to, uh, to really say anything, I guess, tomorrow in the, in the session with uh, Roberto and, uh, and Luis Carlos, this will be probably be a, a very important point. Uh, we have the, uh, a problem with the current account. We have the, what uh, 
uh, Brecher has always insisted on the importance of this problem in our case. Even if we could control capital, we still have uh, uh, some vulnerabilities in, in the balance of payments that are rooted in other processes that uh, are also creating over uh, pressures for uh, over appreciation and uh, you have this uh, threat of uh, deindustrialization of losing uh, the substance of your manufacturing industry you distort the services account we have this incredible expense on uh, uh, on the tourism account for instance is very uh, is usually very expensive to uh, for tourists to come to brazil uh, uh, and it's very easy to go out so we have this strong deficit in the income account, uh, uh, the, the remittances, this is also very important and, of course, has uh, impact on employment uh, and uh, income distribution. These are all relatively independent of the capital account, but they have always to, to be identified and kept there. Otherwise, you are going to demand from capital controls things that they cannot uh, actually uh, offer. Coming more specifically to the question of, uh, of capital controls, uh, of course, uh, uh, the problem of, uh, of, capital, of free capital movements, uh, they, they are different, but they happen uh, no matter the sign of the, of the account. If you have uh, too much uh, capital in, you, 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 you uh, overappreciate the currency, you lose exports, you lose domestic competition, which is even more important. Uh, but even if you have uh, capital outflows, especially uh, in the way they usually happen, very quickly, very suddenly, this is a terrible problem. We, we are living this actually right now, uh, when the, the end of uh, QE was announced and uh, the exchange rate went up very quickly and then people, uh, you have a problem uh, uh, that you threat to accelerate inflation, which in this country should not be forgotten, is a central concern because we had 25 years experience with high inflation and how it can disorganize the economy. So in some other countries, inflation uh, uh, may not be that much of a problem. Uh, it's not our case. I believe it's not the case of Argentina uh, and other countries that had, uh, had our uh, experience. So uh, this element should not be uh, ever uh, underestimated. It's something that, uh, and not only among economists, this is with the general public. Is the shortest way to lose an election is to be seen as somebody who is soft on this area because uh, we had this memory. Perhaps two or three generations later, this will disappear, but the Germans to this day still justify whatever they do because of the hyperinflation and the Renaissance and the whatever memories take a long time <laughs> to disappear. Uh, of course, you have a balance sheet problem because all these years, uh, interest rates were much lower in the rest of the world, so you have the private sector uh, very much in debt, uh, every time you see the, the data about debt and, uh, and uh, reserves and so on, it's usually public debt, uh, which is okay because it's the, in a sense, is the most impor uh, important problem beca because it's sovereign debt. But in, in macroeconomic terms, you have always to remember that you have a lot of firms that are in debt. And uh, not all of them have uh, any hedge instruments to support them in the case of, uh, of uh, 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 depreciation. And of course, there is a very strong impact uh, on expectations uh, when the dollar, the dollar is a very, even in a non-dollarized economy, as Brazil is and always was, this is a very important difference with the case of Argentina, but even then, uh, uh, the exchange rate to the dollar is something that you see in the news, in TV, it is in the papers all uh, uh, every day. And if it moves too fast, people get afraid even if they don't have any, any idea of uh, what kind of influence and through what channels this could, uh, could happen. So with uh, uh, underinflation targeting, the thing is even worse because under inflation target, the central bank has not even a choice 
if you have some uh, volatility, especially if you have some depreciation of, uh, of the exchange rate, this uh, almost immediately uh, causes some, uh, some pressure on, on prices and the central bank raises the interest rate in the economy, uh, stalls uh, almost uh, automatically. The question of, uh, of uh, using uh, uh, the, I think this is the second lesson or third, I, I lost like my account, uh, to, to pursue further liberalization as a way to control the effects of liberalization. Uh, at this point, not uh, uh, really, really not even the IMF insists on this uh, very insistently, but governments are still follow, uh, following this. Uh, the idea that you, uh, you facilitate payments abroad and so on for exporters or for financial investors and so on. This would uh, counteract uh, the pressures to overappreciation. Uh, this, in fact, doesn't really work. Most of the capital inflows that we had uh, in the, since 1994 were due to the interest differentials that we could see in the graph that Kevin uh, showed. And those differentials were much, much higher uh, than anything that you could earn uh, anywhere else. So it doesn't really matter if you make uh, it easy to leave the country, to, to, to leave the country because nobody does. Everybody wants to buy public debt because it's safe uh, and uh, it, uh, it pays a lot. Brazil does not issue public debt in dollars. It's always in the local currency, so insolvency uh, uh, cannot uh, happen. And they paid very high interest rates. So when capital was really abundant, this kind of measures don't help because nobody leave just because the door is open. And then if, you, if your situation change, nobody comes to, uh, to, the, to the help of the country, they just keep their money outside because the situation, the domestic situation becomes too, too risky. So you don't gain anything when you, uh, when you open the way out. Uh, the only thing is that you lose the reserves that you could have if the former laws in terms, for instance, exports the obligation to convert their revenues into domestic uh, currency, which used to be uh, mandatory and is no longer that. Uh, actually, it is, but without a, a you don't have a, a deadline. So you are supposed one day, uh, whenever you wish uh, to do. So it's equivalent to have uh, eliminated. So it doesn't really work against uh, inflows, further liberalizing, just uh, uh, at the best situation, it is uh, just uh, useless. Uh, just two points that I will take quickly because my, my, my time is up, uh, is the idea of uh, what kind of controls we should try if we decide we, in this case, is, is, is Brazilians, but uh, it should serve to other countries too. Uh, there is always this attempt to act through incentives, uh, give market incentives, and to discriminate between the good capital and the bad capital or whatever. And usually the most uh, visible result of this is that, is that you reorient. We had here as a result, as one of the results, for instance, when the tax on financial inflows uh, were uh, imposed, that suddenly you look at the foreign investment, foreign direct investment, and it grew very quickly. And uh, suddenly, all the, uh, all the firms in the world decided to increase their capital assets in this country. It was very unlikely. What they did was that they re-denominated uh, re the contracts. So, uh, the Chilean, for instance, capital controls, which is you create a barrier that uh, hits everybody, is usually more, effici uh, more efficient than this. Uh, it, it allows to have some lower barriers that uh, may be less prejudicial to the real economy. Uh, but the most important point is that, uh, 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 and this looks like Basel, Basel II, uh, if you begin to, 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 cr to create uh, charges because of a higher risk, you either do like Deutsche Bank, recalculate the risks and find out that they are not as big uh, as they were the day before, 
Or what you they do is that you change the names, you change the accounts, and so on, and uh, it, this reduces uh, a lot. So blunt instruments are usually much better. Sophistication for regulators should not be a concern. I think some regulators uh, are always, uh, they want to be modern, they want to be uh, economically efficient, and usually this is a waste of time. And finally, uh, is a political problem, which I think is always very important. After you liberalize, it's very difficult to go back. You create interest groups. Uh, I myself, I am in a very schizophrenic position because I'm interested in keeping uh, everything open because I travel a lot to see my grandchildren. But here I'm defending the opposite. This is a, I will regret this later and I hope nobody actually pays attention. Uh, but the fact is that you have all kinds of interest groups that are connected with the idea that, uh, that uh, not with the idea, actually, uh, who actually enjoy the gains of having access to an a, a overappreciated currency. You travel is more, uh, is more cheap. You can import uh, more modern goods. And then you want, of course, more modern goods. You don't want any other restriction. And uh, uh, when these this controls, like uh, uh, the imposition of the uh, uh, financial transactions tax here, uh, the next day all the papers are pointing out to the intervention of the state and uh, how old it is. It's not a modern way to do this. It violates. Uh, uh, this argument has been use them uh, 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 many times, it violates fundamental freedoms, uh, like you do have the freedom to, to buy dollars or buy euros or something like this. Uh, it's not in our constitution, by the way. But this has been framed as a discussion, well, the military did this, so by definition, you should not think of controls because now we are a free country and people should be able to do whatever they want what, uh, with what belongs to them. So the, the political debate here is, is an uphill exercise because you face uh, difficulties all the time. And if you have some of the difficulties I was mentioning, and, and so after you take the measures and the problem is still there and the standard is very demanding, you either stop overappreciation or you are going to face the judgment that that was a waste of time. Uh, people told us so, and we insisted on these old-fashioned things. We should know better. So it's very uh, uh, important to have it uh, clear that it is a subject that, uh, that is going to uh, raise a very strong opposition. The idea that you are not doing anything criminal, you are not the dollars you bought is not because you sold cocaine or something like this, and this uh, uh, is perhaps much stronger than sometimes we realized before. So the point is, as much as possible, retain whatever you have. Uh, for instance, if you have some taxes in the law books, don't eliminate. Put them to zero if there's the case uh, in, in a in a given situation, but keep it, keep them there, because if you need to use again, everything will come back precisely as it was before. You are going to face the same criticism, and so on. So, I, uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, uh, I, I wanted to focus on the practical sides, uh, uh, aspects of uh, our experience. Uh, so, thank you for your attention. <laughs> Well, well, I will. Um, my presentation will be connected with Kevin and Kajin. I will talk about more international context and uh, as well as the Brazilian. I will try to illustrate the Brazilian more recent experience with uh, uh, capital controls. Well, uh, so uh, my, my, my concern here is about macroeconomic governance or policy space under financial globalization and some issues to emergent economies. Uh, I will, I divided my, my presentation, I will 
talk about some recent characteristics of the cross-border capital flows and some consequences to emergent economies, and then I will face two main questions, two main points that uh, the, the, the first is, is if the implementation of free floating combined with more open capital account allow, is allowing a greater independence of monetary policy, that is, the, 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 to overcome the impossible trinity. And also, I will focus on the uh, IMF new institutional approach, and I will contrast with what I am calling a more integrated approach of capital account regulation, and I will illustrate, put, give you an example of the, the Brazilian recent experience on capital control that is to show that is different to, uh, in, in comparison to the lessons of the IMF new approach. Well, let me begin with uh, the two, two, two put the light here or here? Uh, the center. The center. Okay. okay, thank you. Just to show some, some figure that is, uh, this is from advanced economy, the total flows in person percent of GDP, and here is uh, the emergent economies, right? It's just to show that uh, in terms of growth in flows, advanced and emergent economy, they are very correlated, both movements. There is a sort of cool movement between these trends. But when we, we focus on the net inflows, we see that uh, in the, uh, for, for advanced economy is in very low level, but for emergent economy, you have a, a higher level that is also correlated with the gross inflows. So what's the explanation for this movement uh, in contrast with this behavior? Uh, we can see here that now we, 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 we this here is advanced economies and here is emergent economies. The total flows against we have, so in this case we have gross inflows, gross outcomes and net inflows. So in case of the, the advanced economy, the explanation that we have the low levels of net inflows is the fact we have this complementarity between Gross inflows and gross out, uh, gross inflows and gross outflows. As we can see, the symmetric movement here that explains this low level of net inflows. But in case of the emergent economies, we see uh, that uh, in general, the the amount of gross inflows is higher than gross outflows. This is explain why you have a higher level higher amount of net inflows. So that is, is important for, for some implications that we will discuss here. So uh, in terms just to, 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 to sum up these this initial uh, figures that uh, uh, to show that uh, f first that uh, you have a volatility uh, in terms of capital flows for gross flows for both advanced and emergent economies. And uh, second, that's an important point that we explore, in, uh, that both capital inflows and outflows for both groups of economies tend to rise when global financial conditions are easy and to fall when these conditions tighten. And finally, do you have this, this uh, uh, behavior uh, uh, in that in case of the emergent economy, you have uh, 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 higher uh, inflows than uh, uh, outflows. That means that uh, more recently they, they, they began to increase uh, international uh, reserves for this in that in case of the the, 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 the advanced economies, you have a more stable behavior of the, the, the net inflows that it is explained for the fact that you, that you have a more symmetric movement between outflows and inflows. Well, this has, of course, some important uh, uh, consequences to, to, to the emergent economy. Uh, uh, these are uh, different uh, works 
I am I extract from different uh, IMF and BIS economist works or, or reports. I would just point out two. Of, of, of course, the, as is know that uh, capital flows are uh, pro cyclo that you have episodes of large capital inflows are associated with acceleration of GDP growth, but afterward, afterwards growth often drops sharply. But I would like to, to, to stress two, two main find, findings. That, uh, the, the first, that uh, the surge of capital inflows for emergent economies appears to be associated with the real effective exchange rate appreciation, damage and competitiveness of, of exports export sectors and reducing economic growth. As we have seen, you have this, uh, the, the, the amount of capital inflows is greater than capital outflow, so you have mainly in periods of surge of, of capital flows, you have this trend for appreciation of exchange rate. But at the, at the same time, because we have the uh, greater volatility in terms of the, the, the net inflows, also, you have a problem of asymmetric uh, international uh, uh, financial inter international integration. That is the fact that uh, the amount of capitals uh, related to the, the size of the financial markets of the, 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 the emergent economy that is steam generates high volatility. So the empirical work shows that volatility of exchange rates in emergent economy tended to be greater than in advanced economy. So we have two problems. We have a problem of the trend of appreciation of exchange rates. At the same time, you have a problem of volatility of exchange rates. Well, we, we know this very well, that impossible trinity, the, the very no trilemma that says that countries cannot have simultaneously pegged exchange rate, open capital account, independent monetary policy. That, uh, so that uh, the main implication is the fact that with free capital mobility, independent monetary policies are, are feasible if exchange rates are floating. But uh, as we show, uh, there is a, 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 a recent uh, paper of uh, Elena Hay that I will mention here that uh, uh, show that there is no dilemma, but it's, it's a dilemma, as we will show in the sequence. Now, this is a, 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 this is an interesting work, uh, empirical work from a, a, a BIS economy, Saxena, 2008, that compare, that shows, that use VAR in order to, to, to show the, imp the impulse response of domestic interest rates to U.S. interest rates when exchange rates are floating and also in the sequence when the, 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 the exchange rate is pegged. So what is, for, according to the, the, the the trilemma, the impossible trinity, if you have uh, a floating exchange regime, you, 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 you can uh, reach a more independent monetary policy, right? Then compare it to a packet exchange uh, rate regime. But the, the, the empirical uh, results, the empirical figure shows just the opposite. So in this case, that's just to focus, this is from this period, 7 to 5, 2006. That is the, the for a period of, of, of uh, for uh, a period of uh, ten months, right? Here is for is shared for the two period. But I'd like to just to show this that uh, uh, you you have this. This is about 25, 25 points. We are exchange rate are fixed. Going back. No, sorry. Oh, 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 what? No, sorry. Here, yeah, okay. Going back, we, ha we have uh, around 40%. Uh, so the impact of, uh, so the, the cool movement, the, the correlation between the domestic interest rate to U.S. interest rate is higher in case of floating regime than in the emergent economies than in packet exchange regime. Well, 
So uh, the, main, the, main, the main findings is that uh, flexible regimes tend to exhibit greater cool, mo cool movement with U.S. interest rates than the packet exchange rate regimes. In other words, with, with, even with flexible exchange rate regime, the autonomy of the monetary policy has been reduced with greater international financial integration. Well, let me, this, there is a very recent paper that is very complementary with the, the former ones from the Elena Hay, that's uh, uh, also with uh, its econometric work. Uh, as I, <laughs> I say to my students sometimes, econometric work is necessary to show the obvious, right? <laughs> but it's necessary to show. It's something, it, there are a lot of things that we have talked a lot, a long time ago, we are more heterodox economists that the, the orthodox economists are just discovering nowadays. Well, <laughs> it's okay. But uh, uh, it's very competent to economic work of uh, Ellen and Ray that show that, uh, that tested uh, how independent is the, 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 the monetary policy to the conditions of the international financial uh, liquidity and, uh, and and she shows that monetary policy conditions are transmitted from the main financial center to the rest of the world mainly through gross credit flows and leverage irrespective of the exchange rate regime the conclusion is that floating exchange regime cannot insulate economies from the global financial cycle when capital is mobile so the, the global financial okay the global financial uh, cycle transform the trilemma into a dilemma. So uh, independent monetary policy are possible if and only capital account is managed directly or indirectly via <coughs> macroprudential policy. So it's the case for capital account regulation. So this is a discovery for <laughs> more orthodox economists. But uh, I remember, for, for instance, James Tobin uh, in this, this paper, 1978, it's the paper that he launched the, what was called later as Tobin tax, right? And Tobin, that time, said, I believe that the basic problem today is not the exchange rate regime, whether fixed and floating. Debate on the regime evades and obscures the essential problem, that is, the excessive international mobility of private financial capital. So it's exactly what more recent empirical works are showing. Well, well, as we know, uh, 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 Kevin has mentioned that the uh, IMF uh, has uh, changing uh, their position about capital control that uh, they are against capital controls and uh, they are what they are calling it's not me that I got the, the new institutional approach on, on capital controls that's uh, they, they, they say that capital controls are part of the toolkit when certain macroeconomic conditions are satisfied so they are in favor of uh, a sort of triple hierarchy between instruments to manage capital inflows that first, you, you, you sh uh, macroeconomic policy should be applied. That means building f uh, foreign reserves, letting currency appreciate, and cutting budget deficits. Then, after exhausting this instrument, you, you use prudential regulations on the domestic banking sector that affect cross-border uh, flows. And finally, if it is it's still is failing, that uh, the, the pressure on a chain rate is, is still uh, happening, you, 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 you use, uh, when prudential tools are insufficient, you use capital controls as a transitory measure of last resort. Well, I will now uh, talk uh, quickly about the Brazilian experience to show exactly that the Brazilian case succeed uh, with capital controls in 2009 and 2011, so only the government uh, used all this, uh, used not only prudential regulation, but combined with capital control. So a more, what I am calling a more integrated approach of, 
on capital account regulation. And uh, what I am calling an integrated approach of capital account regulation is that uh, capital account regulation can, has, uh, should not be seen as a measure of last resort, but uh, as a permanent part of the policy toolkit to be used in a counter-cycle way to smooth booms and busts, as I mentioned. One of the reports that Kevin sh showed here, and also to increase policy space to exert controls over the key macroeconomic policies like interest rate and exchange rates. Well, uh, also, of course, okay. And uh, my importance is that the, I will show that IMF triple hierarchy is not appropriate to deal with the policy issues as there are important feedbacks and complementarities between capital controls and prudential financial measures. Well, is this, it's, uh, I, I took this, this, this figure from the, the from a book from Jenny and Williamson, and so it's just to, to illustrate some difference between a more softer, soft style of uh, implementing capital controls and a not so soft style. So, so the idea of the, this, this what uh, prudential capital controls is the idea that you have a natural trend of the real exchange rates, and you, the, the less effect do, uh, you have uh, oscillation of the exchange rate. So the idea is to, with the use of, with the use of capital control, you reduce the volatility of the exchange rate, but not affect the level of the exchange rate. So the, the idea of the, 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 the more integrates approach is that you have not only to reduce volatility, but also you have to affect the, the exchange rate with use of distortive capital controls. Well, uh, quickly, the, the Brazilian experience uh, uh, on capital controls, as, as Kajin said, is very hard to introduce capital controls when you have a, a rude process of, of capital account liberalization. In case, but uh, the fact that Brazil has a specificity that uh, uh, is the fact that uh, operation in derivative foreign exchange markets are non-deliverable. That implies that can be carried out without any effective foreign capital flows. And more important, exchange rate is mainly defined, begins to implement price-based capital controls as with the use of a financial tax on capital inflows, IOF in low level in 2009, and later increasing the percentage of the IOF and becoming even more comprehensive, including both portfolio, different modalities of portfolios and also external loans. It was, but however, it did not work, this, this sort of, uh, uh, of capital controls. And so it was only with the implementation of prudential regulations, reserve requirements on banks' short dollars position in spot markets, and derivatives regulation with financial tax on excessive long position in Brazilian reais that the currency began to de devaluate. So uh, this is uh, uh, the exchange rate in the case of, of Brazil, you use this Brazilian reais over Dollars, that means that when you are declining, you have appreciation. When you are increasing, you have depreciation. So this is uh, uh, just a lot, of, a lot of measures of capital controls. Foreign ex uh, the, here is this derivative uh, regulation. Here is prudential regulation. So to show, just to show quickly that the government was introducing a lot of measures and finally, when I, as I, I mentioned, it was when, when the implemented uh, uh, some uh, limits to the position of the banks, and also implemented in the notional value, uh, uh, the IOF on the notional value of the, the derivatives operation, that it, uh, it was the case that it used induce a devaluation of exchange rate, and after some time, it, is, it, it became more stable. So, uh, what are the lessons from the Brazilian experience that we can have? 
The first is that capital account regulation have to be dynamic and flexible, uh, involving a steady fine turning to close loopholes found by private agents through spot and foreign exchange derivative transactions. So this is the, 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 the price of in, introducing capital account regulation. You have to, to do some attempts, you have to, to close the loopholes, and you have this, to, you need to be dynamic to see how the, the success of the, the measures that you are implemented. It was only when the Brazilian government adopted all the three kinds of techniques simultaneously, that is, capital controls in more strict sense, prudential financial regulation and foreign exchange derivatives regulation, that policy effectiveness increased in terms of protecting the exchange rate from upward pressures. That means that uh, it's not possible to establish a clear triple hierarchy between instruments to manage the capital flows as supposed by the current IMF approach. So what I am trying to, to show that uh, in my, 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 in my presentation is the fact that uh, you, you don't have a trilemma. Nowadays we have a dilemma. And the implementation of capital account regulation should be done in a more integrated approach and the, not in the style of the, uh, as a, a temporary measure with a triple hierarchy as is the position of the IMF. Thank you. As Luis Fernando has pointed out to us, most mainstream economists are just discovering these problems. And I'd like to point out that anybody who cares to look for the probably definitive justification for capital controls, it's in volume two of Keynes' treatise on money, where he argues very strongly that it is necessary to control capital movements for the simple reason that financial market prices always adjust more rapidly than the prices of labor and the prices of real goods and can continually create distortions in the economic system. And this was already, as I say, in the treatise on money prior to the general theory. Now, I want to thank my panelists for sticking precisely to 10 minutes over the time that they were allowed it, which was the design behind the <laughs> restriction, which gives us a half an hour for discussion. So I'm very happy to open the floor to questions to any of the three panelists, please. Martin. So I'm Martin Rapetti from CEDES uh, and University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. So this, um, this question is for uh, Luis Fernando. I, I don't think I, I quite uh, understood your, your point because uh, you said that, um, that there is a dilemma, not the tri trilemma, uh, if I understood correctly. So if that's the case, why bother with uh, capital controls? Because uh, you, you, are F, uh, you are you're stuck with, with uh, two options, and so there is no, no uh, room for, for uh, or implementing capital controls doesn't help uh, at all because you, you either have to choose between the two of, of those, right? In, in the trilemma, it makes sense to, to impose capital controls because if you impose them, you, you, you eventually have the option of having uh, monetary policy and, and exchange rate policy. But if you are set in, in a dilemma situation, I don't see why bother with capital controls. Are there any questions on that particular, along that particular line? Anybody would like to follow up with a similar question? Okay, then Luis Fernando, you would, you may respond. Okay. It's uh, this work of uh, Ellen Hay, right? And the, the idea, as as I understood, that's it, the, the the when we had the, the trilemma, as you know, you have the, the option in order to have independence of monetary policy. You have to sacrifice the mobility of capital accounts or to implement floating exchange regime. What she's saying that uh, the, the, the floating exchange regime uh, does not assure the, the, the independence of monetary policy. So you, you need to have uh, uh, capital controls in order to have independence. This is the idea. 
right? You need to have it, uh, uh, and uh, that's it. Bert. Thanks, uh, Albert Keitel. I'm, I'm just curious, I don't know much about regulatory systems. If a country doesn't have capital controls. This, this question for me. For anybody who knows the answer, yeah. Everybody, <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Maybe nobody. What, <laughs> Maybe you nobody. know, what, uh, what is the need in terms of personnel, skills, organizations within the regulatory structure to implement then uh, an effective capital control regime? In other words, how, how much do you have to beef up the regulatory system that you already have? What presence do you need? What, what kinds of accounting uh, examinations uh, did, do you have to make? Does it change at all? Is it, is it perfectly doable with, let's say, standard systems of uh, bank regulatory systems and other kinds of financial flow regulatory systems? Or does it really take quite an investment and a certain skill level, uh, both human capital and then, you could say, staffing and so forth? I just, I'm just interested how much of a barrier that is, because you talk about the difficulty of reintroducing it, uh, and, and it certainly is there politically once people get used to, uh, to it. And there's also the problem of the financial sector's own interest in, in uh, conducting a lot of cross-border transactions. Uh, but what does a regulatory system have to do, if anything? Maybe everything is just doable. You just give them additional instructions. I just wonder. Okay, since Nelson, who knows the answer to that question, just walked out, the three of you are going to have to answer it. <laughs> That's exactly what I was going to say. I was going to say, oh, well, let's, uh, let's ask Nelson, because he, uh, he coordinated the whole, the whole thing. And, and um, you know, as Luis Fernando noted, you, you need to have a lot of fine tuning. But in, in, the, in the case of Brazil, first, they have this piece of legislation that's on the books. That's really, that's really important, especially as the world trade regime gets integrated. Because if you have a piece of uh, legislation on the books, then when you're negotiating a trade deal, you can get an exemption for the legislation. So Chile, with every country except for the United States, was able to get an exception for their regulation. Um, that takes statecraft. Um, South Korea is the only country with the United States that's been able to exempt it. So then they have a piece of legislation on the books that allows you to turn it on and off um, to be countercyclical. However, you need real institutional ca capacity to be able to do it. And so Indonesia just put in a very small withholding tax and just sort of announced it at a press conference and nothing, ha you know, didn't change anything. And if you, I had those, that one slide that showed that the South Koreans and the Brazilians are just following the money. Right? At one point when the Brazilians first put in the regulations, then uh, inflows started to come in through the ADR market. And so they slapped uh, something on the ADR market. Then they find a big bloating of the foreign exchange derivative market again. And so they create these things. And so they, so they're constantly trying to do that. And, and the, 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 um, the, uh, when we had a workshop about this, um, the Chinese are the country that has the most sophisticated institutional capacity. They put out an annual report of capital flight. They sequester it because when, when they found out a couple years ago that three, there's been estimate of $3 trillion of capital flight just from government officials. Um, that's why the, you noted in your presentation that if China opens up the capital account, you're probably going to see more outflows than inflows, whereas U.S. Congress people think it's going to mean inflows and an appreciation of the exchange rate and more factories in the United States. That's not going to be the case. But uh, the institutional capacity component is really sophisticated. I mean, we're talking about the countries that have been able to be more sophisticated about these, and that's South Korea, Brazil, and so forth. Um, but other countries, Uruguay, Costa Rica, have experimented with these in the past couple of years. They haven't been as effective. and. Uh, and there needs to be more. I'm doing a workshop at, at UNCTAD next week where we're bringing South Korean, Brazilian, Indonesian, Indian, and, and so forth folks together to sort of help draw country experiences and design principles because you really have to be on top of this stuff. Um, so a lot of the conversation has been about how do you actually manage the, in, manage the regulation. And I think another key thing that we've learned at this time is you also have to learn how to manage and talk about what you're doing to the markets. Like I said in, in my presentation, that uh, Brazil's had to pay a little bit for the way that they talk to the markets about what they did, whereas South Korea just has pretended. And I, I would agree with your comment that it's harder to re-regulate than it is to deregulate. 
Um, but I think this is a moment because the world, the G20 and so forth, we're all talking about macro prudential regulation and re-regulating financial markets. So if we talk about th reintroducing this as macro prudential regulations to deal with imbalances, it's an opening that, uh, um, that we shouldn't let, um, let get out of the way. Could I just add, uh, I think uh, 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 you do have uh, important requirements then in, uh, in two functions. Uh, one is to formulate the controls, which are not easy because you have to be, uh, you have to have some deep knowledge of, uh, of the channels and how the banking system works. Uh, so if some operations are done, for instance, through off-balance sheet operations, you have to know all this, those mechanisms. So to create, it is difficult. It, it, uh, it requires experience. The second need you have is for enforcement, uh, which also requires experience, a different kind of experience, uh, and requires also something that perhaps sometimes is forgotten, which is, especially after so many years of liberalization, is that one thing that you find in many places, including here, is that the enforcer does not really believe in controls. They are doing this because politically somebody uh, in, in, the, in some higher position decided. But then you get, for instance, the central bank in Brazil accumulated a very strong experience in the 70s. Uh, the, the central bank of Brazil is, <coughs> is a young institution. It was created in 1965. But during the 70s, during the period in which you had these extensive controls, you had a very uh, strong experience on this. And one, uh, uh, one, uh, one information about this was the size of the black market. You have strong controls in a very, very small black market, actually. Uh, you didn't have any movement in the official exchange rates, for instance, that was caused by movements uh, uh, in the exchange market. It was mostly for tourists and so on, because the control over the banking system was very strong. Of course, you have a problem that uh, how far you need an authoritarian government to be able to do this. But again, uh, when you compare in Europe the experience of France in the post-war period with Germany, uh, in France, controls worked very well because the banking system obeys, actually, the regulators. In Germany, uh, controls didn't work that well because the banks sided with clients. They helped them to find their way to Luxembourg and so on, while in France they didn't. So uh, uh, you have to have the enforcement system uh, on board uh, because otherwise you begin to create some facilities to avoid, and you demoralize the system. Uh, and publicly, it is demoralized because the data begins to show that it's not working, uh, and so on. So it's not easy. Uh, after liberalization, one of the losses that liberalization causes is that you kind of lose this experience. Uh, you don't have these people working anymore. They retired, and they were not allowed to to pass. It's like industrial policy. When you had liberalization, here in Brazil you have this National Development Bank, who is a very, very powerful source of industrial policy. And then for a few years, uh, it became just focused on, on privatization. You had to, to rebuild all over again because all that experience was, or almost all of it, was lost. So it's not easy. You, 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 you really have to be convinced that uh, it is work. And then you have to develop the competences to do this. It's, it's, it's not that simple. But it's not uh, quantum mechanics on the other side. So it is feasible, but it does require investment uh, on this, on training. Okay, just uh, one, one brief comment is that uh, I think that is important to, to uh, in order to apply capital account regulation, to understand the specificities of the financial system of each country, right? Just uh, to have an example, in the case of Mal Malaysia that uh, introduced uh, controls on, on capital outflows to after the, 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 the Asian crisis, it was only when they closed the offshore, they had the offshore, the onshore and offshore, the speculation was 
made by the offshore financial system. It was only when they closed the offshore financial system that, that they, could, they could control exchange rates. So this is, in the, and also the, uh, in the, there is different uh, modalities of the, in the case of most countries that liberalize capital account, you, everything is allowed unless you put in law, in the normal. In the case of the China and India, it's the opposite. Everything is forbidden unless you put in the norm. It's a different approach. It's much easier to work with the, the second approach than in the case of the first approach. Do you want to talk something? Yeah. Yes. Add, add two things. One, on, on the enforcement. One of the things I've been, I was at a uh, workshop with, with Nelson Barbosa, and because uh, institutionally here, the taxes go under the fe federal tax system. You can actually go to a jail for evading them, whereas some of the other uh, some of the other policies, it's hard it's hard to it's hard to enforce them. And since there's annual auditing and so forth, that's important. I guess one thing, you know, all, all of us economists, we don't talk about this this much, but you did mention it in your in your report and in your presentations. The politics really matters too, and it's really, uh, you know, if if you if you start to back out and think about the politics of the exchange rate, there's a lot of things that have to align right, and the role of public credit is really important. Uh, a number of people have done studies across countries about why do some countries use capital account regulations and some not, even though they're all getting pummeled at the same time because of global interest rates and they're having, uh, uh, having the same kind of bubbles in their countries. Well, ch you know, during the past five years, we've had Brazil and Peru put in regulations and we have Chile, Colombia and Mexico not. Mexico not. Uh, how come? And one key thing is the alliance between the export sector and the banking sector. Okay, if the banking sector, if the export sector is totally connected to the banking sector for its financing, they're going to be more apt to be in coalition with the banking sector, which by definition, since they have to bear the cost of the regulation, they're after you, right? If the exporters are reliant on that for finance, they are going to have an original sin problem if the regulation works, right? If the regulation works, the, the, all the debt that they just took on expands if the cap if the capital account regulation works one of the reasons why the fiesta here from what i understand was which is a industrial uh, coalition which was at least initially favorable of some sort of innovation in the exchange rate is because here you have a little bit more of public credit for some of these uh, some of this export orientation where they're not totally dependent on foreign banks the way they are in Colombia and Mexico. So the Mexican, uh, the Mexican uh, industrial, uh, industrialists are totally connected to international banks for all their financing. And when you've got international banks, domestic banks, and all the exporters uh, on one side and just a center left or left wing political party on the other, you just can't get the stuff, can't get stuff through. And if everyone in your central bank went to the University of Chicago, that hurts too. <laughs> okay, the gentleman behind Frank back there. Um, my name is Juan Pablo. I'm from the Brasilia Central Bank. Uh, just a point on the regulation of the on the FX markets. Yes, I, I think it, it, it has worked, but uh, I think we should remember that the time that these uh, regulation was implemented was in the same time that the European crisis get worse. It was not only the Brazilian real that has depreciated, it was all other similar currency at the same time. So it has worked, but not so because we have a, a financial crisis at that time, or it's only uh, get uh, better in the end of the that year, 2011, when the ECB has implemented the, the liquid measures. And also, uh, it's related to the question that I would like to address to Kaljin. It relates to the, okay, you have a capital control, but uh, people familiar with the Brazilian market knows that the Brazilian banks, they get other uh, ways to overlap these um, controls on the FX market, derivative markets. As you could see, uh, two months ago, when they pay back the loans, in order, in, Instead of they get short on dollar, domestically they did op offshore. That is related with the, the, my question. In which way the rules of capital controls work when you have a huge offshore market? Offshore markets and also related with the company because we would like to have capital controls because volatility is bad for the real capital. 
but if the companies on the same time they have get more money, they have get hold more uh, financial assets, and mainly as the consequence of the 2008 crash, they have hold, at least for the Brazilian case and the South Korean that uh, I know more or less, they have hold a foreign currency uh, uh, assets. So they have these two uh, points: how they work with the offshore and so if the capital products are good for the companies, but they, on the same way, they have more protect with the volatile life exchange rate by holding a foreign currency assets. The other point is related really for the political ones that you Cardi mentioned that when it was regulated, it's, it's difficult to get back. It's related with the different implementation of the capital controls because in terms of the political support for this, because it's easy to um, defend uh, capital controls when the capital flight, because we have uh, immediate effects. Because you have a capital flight, you have bankruptcy, you have inflation, you have all else. But in the appreciation time, what would be the, the political support, the visible one? Because if you see for the Dutch disease to manifestation of Dutch disease in the Brazilian case, it took uh, 10 years to see. Okay, we have we have been um, aware of this for many years, but it's difficult. So it's it's taken in consideration the difference time on the implementation of c capital controls in, in order to get political support because we know that we, it's necessary to have political support for for, for this implementation. Thank. You. Okay. Question is about the derivatives market as well. Actually, uh, I, he talked about the importance of the offshore. Uh, market here, and as far as I understand, I mean, we have a, maybe it's the same in other countries, but we have a very big futures market uh, with a huge role for um, offshore um, banks or hedge funds that are basically hedging with our futures markets, and then our domestic banks hedge uh, with the spot market, which brings all the pressure from abroad into our spot market. And that has been, I understand, a huge difficulty in introducing capital controls here in Brazil, right? Uh, what, I, what I see is uh, when you have a situation like that, it becomes not only a matter of rhetoric to say that it's prudential regulation, but in fact, uh, it gets, uh, the solution gets away from the, the basic idea, or at least how I understand that capital control is defined, and goes more and more towards an actual uh, need for prudential regulation in the derivatives market domestically, uh, which doesn't mean introducing a tax. It actually means regulating this market and trying to constrain its effects in the spot market. But I don't see exactly how we have moved forward uh, in that sense. Uh, I think Luis Fernando talked about this a little bit. But uh, what the solution there uh, is not clear to me. What, what should we do in that market to make it uh, less, um, I don't know, uh, make it less, uh, to make it repercut, uh, repercuss less to, to the spot market? So. so now I guess it's a question for all three of you. So. <laughs> Uh, well, if I, if my notes here are, are correct, uh, the first thing was about the offshore markets, uh, which uh, Laura is also worried about, and the second is about what kind of political coalition would support controls on inflows. Is this that you were? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Everybody loves an appreciation. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, with the offshore markets, uh, I think it is, uh, again, it, uh, it is largely a matter of, uh, 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 of, actually, it is in the power of the central bank uh, uh, to control, uh, uh, to a large extent at least, not entirely perhaps, but uh, many of these offshore operations are actually done with uh, subsidiaries of domestic banks. Uh, and I remember that when the central bank a few years ago, perhaps 10 years ago, uh, actually uh, as a result of some decision in, 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 in Basel, 
uh, as to how to deal with, uh, with the subsidiaries in offshore markets. And of course, you have one uh, problem uh, since the start, is that uh, these people go to offshore markets because they want to, uh, to, to hide, actually. And what the central bank here did, I remember well, was that, uh, uh, and this was the case of Banespa, the extinct bank uh, that, that was a state-owned bank in, in, in Sao Paulo, which had a huge uh, operation in the Caymans or something like this, some place like this. Uh, and when the central bank demanded uh, information about the subsidiary and so on, uh, and Banespa refused because it was uh, under a different jurisdiction, uh, another country. That uh, What the central bank here decided, uh, I'm not still sure if this is still in force, but this is what was, uh, they decided and implemented for a few years, is that all the charges, the, uh, the regulatory charges that were imposed on Banespa would be imposed by the ceiling because the central bank would presume what was being done in the offshore, uh, by the offshore subsidiary. So they would presume that all the, the, the risk groups were at the maximum. So all the regulatory demands from the central bank uh, uh, on the domestic headquarters of Banespa became very, very heavy which induced Banespa very quickly to change their position and give the information because it would be much cheaper. So again, offshore markets, I think sometimes we, we, we talk about offshore markets as if there's another planet with their own rules and so on. Offshore markets occupy uh, the space that is allowed them to, exp uh, you see what Switzerland did with the, the, the tax fraud, uh, the evaders that, uh, it, it was sufficient that the U.S. government threatened that, okay, you are not going to operate in American territory anymore if you don't give the information. Then the Swiss parliament got together to vote to, to, to change the law. So I think offshore markets are, uh, uh, sometimes it is forgotten that it's not something that uh, nature created and you, uh, it's like, I don't know, uh, HIV uh, uh, virus, uh, 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 it's an institution, uh, uh, it's, it's an institution alternative to escape controls. And what a regulator should do in this case, extend the controls. And, uh, and I think the example here was very clear that this is possible. Uh, I, I have, I, I was a little critical in my presentation of the central bank, not the central bank itself, actually the con controls were removed not by the central bank, who, uh, uh, not by decision of the central bank, they were the instrument of, of doing this. But in terms of, uh, of financial regulation, domestic financial regulation, the Brazilian central bank has a very strong tradition of controlling, it is, it's the French tradition that, uh, that there may be things that they don't know, but if they found out, if they find out that they don't know, they demand the information, and usually they may be very threatening. And with offshore, it, this was very effective. About the coalition, I think uh, uh, you have, of course, you have always a problem that uh, people who are eventually losing jobs because of deindustrialization are diffused, while the tourists that are in the line in the airport to go to Miami buy iPads are much more vocal, they are all there, the global TV station can interview them and so on, until there is a crash. Uh, perhaps you need a crisis. Uh, this is very unfortunate, but it is, well, uh, uh, actually this is how things end up uh, happening. Everybody is very happy, but you are floating. In Europe, everybody was feeling very safe until the world ended. So, so, uh, uh, I don't know, if a coalition does not come uh, peacefully, it will come like 1998 and then uh, you just have to uh, look for a solution quickly and uh, perhaps not even the best one because you don't have much time. But uh, if you don't decide rationally, you may, be you may end up deciding under under the pressure of uh, actual events. I don't know. It is really uh, a, a speculation on, on politics.
I hope it will. Now I understand why it's so appreciated, actually. That's right. Well, of course. <laughs> and that's, that's why the airplanes are full. Okay, if there are quick responses from either Kevin or... Okay, on the, Fernando, we have to close up here. Two, two things on the political co co coalition and one on the nature of the derivative, derivatives markets. I mean, the, the, for, uh, you know, one key thing is, le is leadership. Um, and because the uh, benefits of financial stability outweigh the costs of, uh, of what it's going to do to certain sectors in the economy. And that's easy for an academic to say, but that's got to be really important, and so there has to be a political narrative around that. As far as backing goes, the savior in a country like this seems to be the, those who are affected by the exchange rate. You have exporters that are affected by the exchange rate. Now, the problem becomes the more deindustrialized the country comes, the, more, the, the less you, you have that political constituency. The more the exporters are connected with the banking system, and the more the exporters rely on imports for inputs. You know, so Mexico is, your, is the worst danger for what, you know, for, uh, if you compare Brazil and Mexico, Mexico exporters, as I said before, totally in bed with international finance. All the finance comes in international dollars through international banks. And 97% of all of the content of every single manufacturing product in Mexico uh, comes from outside. And so those guys are just, you know, they, they, love, they love appreciation. If you have a country that has a manufacturing base where a lot of it is domestic and the manufacturing base does not rely on private and especially international credit for the majority of its expansion, that's an environment in a democratic society for a pretty strong capitalist support for uh, what you're going to do. And also, in a country like this, memory is also really important. I mean, I, I love South Americans in my classes because the stupid gringos don't know how to calculate exchange rates, right? But every Brazilian, uh, you know, they, like you said, it's in the paper every single day. You, you're thinking about this. And I, I always say, oh, well, you're from Colombia, you're from Brazil. Can you tell this stupid kid from New Jersey what this means? And you have this specter of the inflation and of the crises, you know, and I, I, I don't want another one to happen like you, mm -hmm. you but, uh, but uh, you know, the politics of memory is an important, uh, uh, important politics, which uh, on other fronts, you see Latin American presidents talking about this every day um, and, and bringing crises narratives back into leadership agendas is, is important. On the, on the derivatives markets, you know, South Korea is, is not, like, uh, not like Brazil's, and so theirs is all deliverable. They were able to zero in a lot, a lot closer. Um, I'm not a, an expert on the Brazilians, so I'll let the Brazilians talk about the Brazilians, but the euro market is one of the things that eroded the capital control system in the industrialized world. It's also one of the only ways that you got the Wall Street to buy into the Bretton Woods Agreement by letting that happen. But uh, these things have to be regulated because if you look at the northern experience, the euro market was part of the demise of the whole system in the north, which uh, we just paid for in 2008. Luis Fernando, you have two minutes. If okay, you want, if you uh, want to take two, it. Two, two comments. Uh, first, to Juan Pablo, that mentioned about the, that the time that it was implementation of, of capital account regulation in Brazil, that we have a devaluation. It was also the time that uh, the eruption of the, the European crisis. This is true. It's, it is hard to know uh, the, what was really effective, is if it was the measure that was adopted or, or the, the change in the international scenario, probably both. But, but uh, it is in, uh, interesting that uh, uh, I don't know exactly what is the month, but uh, Kevin and I uh, took part of a seminar in the IPEA this year, and uh, one of the the discussion was one of the guys that discussed with us was the economist that worked at that time with Fernando Barbosa. I think the name is Stephen. Stephen, there is some I can't remember. That is the guy that uh, uh, created these these norms. Steps, steps. That's right, steps. Uh, and uh, and Steps said that uh, when they are trying a lot of measures. That's uh, and there are few uh, uh, the trend for appreciation. Uh, but when they they implemented this measure that the IOF on national value of the the future, a lot of 
uh, members of bank went to the minister to, to complain. So they, no, they, they, say, they said, <laughs> it is working, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, uh, so about Laura, now, just about derivative markets. Actually, the fact that Brazil has a derivative, foreign exchange derivative market does not mean that it's offshore markets. It's a, no, it's a domestic. In, Okay, but uh, you have a, uh, uh, but uh, the norm, it, it is, it is operated by the, the Sao Paulo. Yes, but uh, you can, but, but the norm that you implement are domestic. You can introduce the domestic and the, and the, and the, and the fact, uh, of course, that the fact that you have derivative markets, you have a, a, a different sort of carry trade operations, right? Is that it's not only the the the, the uh, carry trade operation that you know, but we, we it was uh, even more greater with the use of the derivatives operation as well. Okay, I think Luis Van. We have to take the break now okay. and. Coffee is again upstairs. Thank you for the panel.